the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. the whistler, and I know many strange things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Rated by independent research, the most popular West Coast program in radio history. And Signal Gasoline is tops, too. Tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal Circle sign in yellow and black that identifies friendly dealer-owned Signal service stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. Ambassador of death. The majority of the guests in Mrs. Helena Forsythe's elegant drawing room looked upon the party for what it was, a highly important marker in the Washington social season. Her guest list was virtually a who's who of the government elite, of foreign dignitaries and the syndicated columnists who recorded their comings and goings. But to Gerald Sanders, consular officer in the diplomatic service, it was even more than this. Mrs. Forsythe was charming. She was a widow, and her influence extended well beyond social affairs. Oh, Mr. Sanders, I've been looking for you. Oh, Mrs. Forsythe, I was about to pay my respects. You'll forgive me, Mr. Sanders, but you know when you came in this evening, it started me reminiscing. Oh, how so? We're old friends as well as old-timers, in a way. Oh, yes. You've been in the diplomatic service for 20 years now, haven't you? 20 years, two months, and eight days. Positive? Positive. <laughs> I've held almost every job on the books, you know. Courier, first secretary, consul. All except one. Uh, yes. Uh, all except one. And that one's on its way. I assume you're referring to Mr. Johnson's resignation? What else? Well, I'd hardly say... Now, don't be modest, Mr. Sanders. You know as well as I that his replacement will come from the ranks of the career diplomat. Of course. But you see, the career diplomat is a rather common bird in these parts. Well, you're not only modest, Mr. Sanders. You're naive, too. Oh? Yes. It's a narrower choice than that. Down to three men, as a matter of fact. You, Eric Thomas, and, uh, let's see, that... Outsider. Uh, Donald Wilkins? Of course. Donald Wilkins. Oh, but he really doesn't have a chance. Uh, of... Mrs. Forsythe. Still Mrs. Forsythe? Why not Helena? Helena, then. <laughs> Your sources of information would do credit to the intelligence department. I shall take that as a compliment. Well, the way it was intended, I assure you. You're a clever woman, Helena. I've always admired you. Have you? Well, I've admired you too, Gerald. Very much. Well, I, I hadn't realized. It's strange, isn't it, that men schooled in the subtleties of diplomatic conversation seldom really understand what a woman has in mind. Uh, Helena, I... <laughs> but I warn you, Gerald, I'm a conniving woman. How do you mean? Nothing is more important to me than seeing someone I, I admire and respect successful. Oh? You must get that appointment. You think I have a chance? It's between you and Eric Thomas. I know it. Poor Wilkins is out of the running, and... I'd be sincerely grateful for anything you can do. Well, I'll do what I can, but most of it's up to you, Gerald. Eric Thomas is the fair-haired boy, but you have the seniority. Uh, he's clever. Of course he is. Look at him over there, playing up to Stanton Edwards, the columnist. <laughs> yes. Frankly, though, I'm not too worried about Thomas. Perhaps later on I'll have a chat with him. Well, 
Good evening, gentlemen. Well, Gerald, how are you? Excellent, thank you. May I speak to you a moment, Eric? Of course. You know Stanton Edwards here? I uh, believe we've met. Hello, Edwards. Weren't you in on that Latin American confab? I'm sorry, Edwards. I can't talk to the press until the department issues its report. <laughs> or to be more frank, you won't be sure of what happened there until you read the papers. Good night, Tom. <laughs> Good night. Good night, Eric. I despise that impertinent upstart. Well, I'm sure he's never mentioned you and his prayers either. What's on your mind, Gerald? The new appointment, of course. It's foolish of me to have asked. Frankly, I want that post, Eric. I served the department faithfully for 20 years, and I think I deserve it. So? Need I go on? Perhaps you'd better. Very well, then. I gave you your start in the service, Eric. Now, the fair thing for you to do is... Step aside. Yes, exactly. I see. I'm not ungrateful for the start you gave me, Gerald. But because you once wrote a letter of recommendation for me, am I supposed to throw away my chance at a post like that? I don't think that's unreasonable. Gerald, there are a few men in this world I love above myself. You are not one of them. It's not only that, Eric. You have a certain degree of brilliance, but uh, you lack maturity, stability. And I suppose that's what you can offer them? I think I can. No, Gerald. You don't mean maturity and stability. What you mean is your fanatical devotion to little things. Decorum, detail. The unimaginative man substitute for intelligence. You have no right to say that. Why, well, I've been in the diplomatic service all my life. What of it? My good man, if human beings were rated as objectively as horses, I would be in the Kentucky Derby and you would be pulling a plow. We're wasting words. Well, is that your final answer? More than that. I not only won't step aside for you, I intend to make every effort to get that appointment myself. Very well. Suppose we step inside for a scotch and soda. I believe we ought to make an appearance together. <laughs> uh, you're really of the old school, aren't you, Gerald? Keep up appearances no matter what the cost. I uh, don't like scotch. Let's make it hors d'oeuvre. Our good hostess is serving some delightful ones with Roquefort cheese. As you wish. There's nothing I like quite as well as Roquefort. Come on, Eric. After you. And by the way, Gerald, I have a bottle of good scotch in my room. Now that we've become enemies, let me give it to you. Oh, don't be ridiculous, Eric. Oh, not at all, not at all. No diplomatic tradition. Bear gifts only to your enemies. Well, here we are about to make our entrance. Let's keep up the front, old boy. It's funny, isn't it? You think so? Of course. Here we go, arm in arm, like a couple of devoted schoolgirls. When basically nothing would suit you better than to see me six feet under the sod. Eric, you're going a bit too far. I don't think so. I can see it in your face. Now, shall we go in? With the prologue of Ambassador of Death, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. But now, since vacation time is here, I'd like to say a word about an item that'll have a lot to do with your driving pleasure. Gasoline. No matter where you travel throughout the West, from Canada to Mexico, you'll find Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline. Almost 2,000 friendly dealer-owned Signal stations stand ready to serve you and to honor your Signal credit card. And remember, when you power your car with Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, you not only enjoy Signal's good mileage, but also the thing which makes that mileage possible, extra engine efficiency. And of course, extra engine efficiency means more thrilling performance for your car. So on your vacation trip and always, to be sure of the tops in gasoline quality, just remember these two points. One, in gasoline, it takes extra quality to go farther. And two, Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. And now back to the whistler. So the lines are drawn, aren't they, Gerald? Long after the party's over, you're still raging over the things Eric Thomas said to you. That you were dull, unimaginative, fit to pull a plow. And he was right, wasn't he, Gerald? 
when he said you'd love to see him under six feet of sod. Yes, for the first time in your life, you feel quite capable of killing a man. You're determined now to let nothing stand in the way of that appointment. And during the next week, you do everything possible within the limits of propriety and drop hints to people of influence in and out of the department. Pass subtle, cutting remarks about Thomas where you know they'll be repeated. Then on Thursday, about ten days before the appointment is to be announced, you discover that Thomas has been working, too, in a more effective way. I'm sorry, Gerald. It's right from the chief. But I tell you, it's out of the question, Bailey. I'm not running off to San Francisco at a time like this to speak at a trade convention. You want me to tell that to the chief? Who's behind this? Don't ask me. I think I know, Bailey. Eric Thomas engineered this to get me out of town till that appointment is. Oh, good Lord, Sanders. Don't be ridiculous. It's true, I tell you. That man is capable of anything. All right. Think so if you want to. It's no skin off my nose. Contemptible, underhanded. Oh, cheer up. You'll have a wonderful time in San Francisco. Nice room at the Grandview Hotel. <laughs> Probably a room full of samples from the trade representatives. No, that stuff. I always give it to the bellboy. I'd examine it first if I were you, Sanders. Knowing you as I do, old boy, I wouldn't be surprised to see someone send you a time bomb. <laughs> bon voyage. <laughs> Yes, Gerald. Eric Thomas has been working, too. And he has the upper hand now, hasn't he? There's no way out. You're under orders from the chief to spend the next few days, the most crucial days in your career, in San Francisco, leaving Thomas a free hand in Washington. You rack your brain all morning, groping for an answer, but there simply isn't any. And that afternoon, when you go downtown to pick up a few things for the trip, you're ready to admit that Thomas has you licked. And then, for some strange reason, something in the window of a fancy food shop strikes your eye. A gift package of imported cheese. You stop for a full minute, thinking. There's nothing I like quite as well as Roquefort. You turn, walk across the street, where you see a few shoeshine boys competing for customers. Shine, mister? Shine them up, only a dime. Yes, all right, son. Oh, uh, before you start, I wonder if you'd do me a favor. Oh, sure. Uh, here, take this, and uh, run over to that shop across the street for me. I want you to buy that small box of imported cheese in the window. Yes, Gerald, there is a way out. But even here, you can't be entirely original. The solution came from Bailey's casual remark only a few hours ago. Knowing you as I do, old boy, I wouldn't be surprised to see someone send you a time bomb. Late that night, the eve of your departure for San Francisco, you put the finishing touches on the package. Address it, not to Eric Thomas, but to yourself. To Gerald Sanders, Grand View Hotel, San Francisco. And in the upper left corner, the return address of a friend of yours in San Francisco, a man named Fred Oliver. It's ready now, Gerald, with enough poison in each of those jars of cheese to kill a dozen men like Eric Thomas. At the plane the next morning, you're greeted by the Flight usual annoying group Omaha, of reporters. Omaha, Denver, Salt Lake City, and San Francisco. How about answering a few questions, Mr. Sanders? I'll answer when I'm free to answer, gentlemen. They're giving two to one at Eric Thomas will get the nod on the new diplomatic appointment. What about that? Uh, no comment. Uh, look this way, Mr. Sanders. Wave your arm. Smile. That's it. Thank you very much, Mr. Sanders. All aboard, Flight 27, Flight 27. departing immediately. Sorry, gentlemen, I'm on my way. Oh, now, look, no, you no, no. give us a bit Don't you understand, English man? I said no comment. Uh, okay, Mr. Sanders. Uh, bum voyage. Yes. The plane trip to San Francisco is uneventful. You land at Mills Field and ride into the city to the Grandview Hotel. That same afternoon, you attend the trade convention. Even enjoy it when your speech receives a handsome ovation. And then shortly before the session ends, you slip away and enter a drugstore phone booth across the street. Grandview Hotel. Mr. Gerald Sanders, please. I'll ring his room, sir. Mr. 
Mr. Sanders doesn't answer, sir. Oh, I see. I'll ring him once more. Uh, never mind. I'll leave a message for him. Yes, sir. Tell Mr. Sanders that we didn't appreciate that speech he made at the trade convention today. Sir, if it's a personal message, I'm afraid you'll have to wait and talk to Mr. Sanders himself. Just put it down, lady. Say that he'd better make a public retraction in time for the morning papers or else. Oh, oh but just a moment, please. I'll connect you with our... <laughs> now, we'll see what happens. And you don't have to wait long, do you, Gerald? No. Soon after you arrive back at your hotel, the manager comes up to your room. He's a very worried man, properly concerned for your safety. Or else. And that's exactly what he said, Mr. Sanders. It alarmed the girl on the switchboard, of course, and I naturally thought that I should be notified. Eh? Well, I, I appreciate that, Mr. Connors, but in this work of mine, that sort of thing occurs quite regularly. Yes, I, I suppose it does. Yes. Oh, frankly, though, I must admit this fellow sounds serious. If I weren't leaving tomorrow, I'd be more concerned. I hope on your next trip out, you won't let the incident reflect on us, Mr. Sanders. Oh, no, not at all. Oh, uh, and I'd like to leave my forwarding address with you. There just might be some mail or something sent to me here. Of course. I'll be glad to attend to it myself. Oh, fine. I generally get my mail at my club, the Carlton. That's uh, Gerald Sanders, care of the Carlton Club, Washington 12, D.C. That's all, Gerald, except for one more thing. Before you leave San Francisco, you drop the small white package, the one that's addressed to yourself, into a mailbox. You know that it won't be picked up and delivered to the Grandview Hotel until after you've left, and that it will have to be sent on to you in Washington. That's exactly what you want, isn't it, Gerald? All the way across the country, you keep reviewing in your mind how it's going to work. When you arrive in Washington, you call on Helena and you wish you could tell her everything, but you don't dare. Indeed, you try not to appear too sure of yourself as she greets you and introduces you to a few guests. Oh, and Gerald, have you met Donald Wilkins? Mr. Wilkins is just leaving, but I do think you two should know one another. Yes, of course. How do you do, Wilkins? Oh, it's a pleasure, Mr. Sanders. I've certainly heard a great deal about you. I well, as Mrs. Forsythe said, I I was just leaving. Uh, see you again, Mr. Sanders. Yes, fine. Goodbye, Mrs. Forsythe. Goodbye, Mr. Wilkins. Hmm. Poor Wilkins. They all come running to me, don't they, Gerald? <laughs> you can't help everyone, Helena. You're so right, Gerald. Besides, we have to make up for lost time. Leaving town didn't help you at all. Oh, Eric Thomas has been gaining ground? He's taken advantage of every moment. I've watched him. I still think I'll beat him out. I know you will, Gerald. But we're going to have to change our tactics. In what way? He's been undermining you in every way possible. I say your move is to bring the fight out into the open. Take it to your superiors. Make it a real fight. I don't think that's necessary. Gerald, you haven't been here. You don't know the power of the man. He'll, He'll be... be stopped, Helena. Uh, in some way, he'll be stopped. Now, let's talk about something else. There's nothing else to talk about until your appointment is assured. <laughs> you are a conniving woman. I only know what I want. And I know that you'll get it. Don't worry, Helena. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Yes, Gerald, you know what you're doing, and it's all working out. On Wednesday, when you arrive at the club, you see Eric Thomas stretched out in front of the fire in the drawing room, as usual. Before joining him, you approach the service desk. Uh, any mail for me? Uh, why, yes, Mr. Sanders. I have a few letters and a package forwarded airmail special delivery from San Francisco. I'll get them for you. Oh, no hurry. Have a page. Bring them to me in the drawing room, please. Oh, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. Oh. Oh, how are you, Gerald? Oh, good evening. How are you? How was the good trip, evening. Sanders? Very fine, thank you, Mason. Good evening. <laughs> good evening. Glad to see you again. Well, Mr. Gerald Sanders, how is my dear friend? Come, friend, draw up a chair. Yes. Thank you, Eric. I will. Sit down. Make yourself comfortable. I trust you had a good trip? Oh, excellent. And uh, <clears throat> in my absence, I trust you've been working hard day and night. And not without some little show of success, I assure you. <laughs> I don't doubt that. Your mail, Mr. Sanders. Oh, yes, thank you, thank you. Yes, sir. Excuse me a moment, Eric. Anytime. 
Yeah, what's this? Package forwarded airmail from San Francisco. <laughs> Must have missed me there. <laughs> well, Fred Oliver sent me a package of imported cheese. Cheese? To you? Oh, yes. Why well, couldn't it have been cigars again or even a crate of oranges? Oh, well, I guess this is just something to give the page boy. Yeah, wait a minute, old man. Any Roquefort in there? Huh? Oh, that's right. You uh, you do like Roquefort cheese, don't you? Well, let's have a look. Yes. Yes, there is a jar of it here. Not a very big one, though. Any amount of imported Roquefort will be gratefully received. Here you are. After all, you did give me some scotch. <laughs> Cast it upon the waters and... Ah, Gerald, you are indeed a friend. I'll think of you when I try this with my tea later on. Oh, please do, Eric. I'd like you to be thinking of me. Well, Gerald, it's complete now. The contents of the little white package have been delivered to the proper party. Only a matter of hours and the appointment will be yours. The next morning, you sit down for breakfast in the club restaurant. The waiter brings a paper to your table, spreads it out. It's all there, Gerald, just as you expected. Too bad about Mr. Thomas. He was a fine man. Oh, yes. Shocking thing. Shocking. Well, we never know. Here today, gone tomorrow. Uh, what'll it be this morning, Mr. Sender? Oh, the usual, I guess. Orange juice, bacon and eggs, coffee, perhaps a little buttered toast. Mom. <laughs> You aren't even thinking of what you're saying, are you, Gerald? No. Your mind is busy now framing answers to the questions that you know will come. You can see a police lieutenant fumbling a little at having to ask and, you a um, question. And you say, Mr. Sanders, that uh, some unknown person phoned your hotel in San Francisco? That's right, Lieutenant. The hotel manager told me about the call. I didn't think too much about it, but now... You figure he's the one who sent you that poison cheese, huh? Yes. In some way, he must have found out the name of a friend of mine and put it down on the return address. That's why you didn't hesitate to hand the package over to Mr. Thomas. Why, certainly. Neither of us had any way of knowing that it was prepared by some maniac. Of course not. You did a perfectly natural thing, Mr. Sanders. A perfectly natural thing. Is your breakfast satisfactory, Mr. Sanders? What? Oh. Oh, yes, waiter. Everything is, uh, perfect. Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, if you've been needing new tires, here are two pieces of good news for you. One, now you can again be choosy about the tires you buy, which means you can insist on genuine Lee tires, the brand your signal dealer is proud to stand back of. Yes, that's Lee of Conshohocken, for over 45 years the finest of first-line tires. And today's Lees are the greatest ever with new post-war features for extra safety, wear, and riding comfort, including Lees' patented double-life rayon cord. And now that second item of good news. Prices have just been substantially reduced on Lee tires, and your signal dealer can now offer you a generous trade-in allowance on your present tires. So there's no longer any good reason to keep on taking chances on those smooth, tired-out old tires. Prepare now for a carefree summer of safe driving. Drive into your signal service station this week and find out how little it'll cost you to drive out on fine new Lee tires. And now back to the Whistler. Well, Gerald, the late Eric Thomas was right, wasn't he? Bear gifts only to your enemies, he said. And that's exactly what you did. Now, with Thomas out of the way, there's no one standing between you and the appointment. You'll receive it in a few days, just as you promised Helena. The questioning that takes place on the afternoon after Eric's death goes almost as you thought it would. The wonder about the friend who sent you the poison rope for it your natural reasons for passing it on to Eric. Everything the way you figured it, except for one thing. 
The man who is doing the questioning is not a police lieutenant, but Stanton Edwards, the columnist, who knew you both so well. Now, see here, Edwards, it's one thing to gather news, but uh, I prefer to make my statements to the police, that is, if they decide it's necessary. Uh, don't worry. They will. And I'd say that it'll be more than a casual questioning. What are you talking about? You're facing a murder indictment, Sanders. The police have everything they need. Edwards, you're going too far. I'll have you... You know, what surprised me is the cleverness of it all. <laughs> I wouldn't have credited you with that much imagination. Yes, yeah, very neat, Sanders. Addressing that poison Rockford to yourself. Are you out of your mind? It was the work of some maniac. Someone who wanted to poison me. Yeah, hardly a maniac, then. Why, well, I never saw that package before last night. And I won't stand for these accusations. I'll have you Stop know that Stop it, I... Gerald. It won't work. You see, I remembered your picture in the paper. I have an excellent memory for people I uh, dislike. My, my picture? At the airport last week when you left for San Francisco. You were standing outside the plane waving your right hand. In your left, you were carrying an overnight bag and a small white package. Huh? Now, I could see the package quite clearly. You had a finger hooked through the string. Why, yes, of course. It, it was a box of candy, a gift for a friend. No, Sanders. I ran down the negative on that picture. It was quite sharp, especially in the enlargement we made up for the uh, police. The printing on your gift box came out nice and large and clear. You're lying. No. The picture showed that the printing read, To Mr. Gerald Sanders, Grandview Hotel, San Francisco, California. That picture was taken here at the airport. And that means you wrapped that package and addressed it to yourself before you left Washington. No, 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 it's not true. Oh, no, yes, it is. And the really horrible thing about it, Sanders, is that it was all so unnecessary. You shouldn't have been so naive about Mrs. Helena Forsyth. Leave Helena out of this. <laughs> Too bad you didn't, old boy. You fell right into line for her. What do you mean? Oh, it's a shame to tell you this now, Sanders. But you weren't the only one she worked on. She was driving Thomas, too. That was her little plan. Plan for what, Edwards? What did she want? She wanted to split things up and create two warring camps in the department. You on one side, Thomas on the other. But why? To make room for her boy, of course. The man she really wanted to see appointed. Donald Wilkins. They announced his appointment this morning. Let that whistle be your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler, each Monday at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. <laughs> Featured in tonight's story were Joseph Kearns and Tom Collins. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen with story by Meyer Dolinsky, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.